Thank you for joining us today for the seventh annual Allen School Women's Research Day. Um, have a seat, get excited. Um, we're really excited to have you here. Um, we're also announcing today that this is the, we're transitioning the name of Women, Women's Research Day to Diverse Genders in CS because we want this space to space for uh, populations in CS. So thank you for joining us for the first Diverse Genders in CS Day as well. Um, as we get started, um, we, we just want to announce what this is for. This is for an opportunity for everyone to explore what research looks at, like at the Allen School, um, make connections with other women, non-binary folks, anyone that feels that they need this space, this is for you. We're glad you're here today. Um, and this is a safe space to ask questions about research, career, life, other advice um, that we're here for, that we've assembled a lovely panel. We have a lovely and um, great hosts in breakout rooms. Um, so get to know people, make it, welcome to our homes. Thank you for inviting us into yours. I'm so excited to get to meet people today. Um, today we have a, a have a quick keynote with Irene. Thank you for joining us today, Irene. And then we'll have a faculty panel um, from Allen School of Faculty. Uh, we'll take a quick break and then we'll rejoin for more informal breakout rooms where you have an opportunity to ask a few undergrads and grad students about how they got started in research and what they're doing now and what opportunities there are to join research. So just a couple norms. If you're comfortable with it, leave your video on so the speaker can see who's speaking, uh, who's participating. It's it's as close as we can get to being in person <laughs> right now. And so um, please stay muted during the main session, reserve the chat for technical questions, but we did enable the chat so you can speak with other people you see in the room. Um, we're happy to have that. Please feel free to chat me. If there's any problems with like someone bothering you, chat with me. I have co-host privileges and we'll take care of that. Um, we have captioning as well. So if captioning is something you need for a breakout room, please also chat me there so that we can make sure that you have what you need today to make this a success. Um, so, and with that, I'm so pleased to introduce Irene. Uh, she's a principal researcher at Microsoft and she's a uh, UW alum and she is the founder of Women's Research Day. So thank you for joining us today, Irene, and I'll hand it off to you. Great. Hi, thanks for uh, having me. It's so great to see everyone. I do have to admit that I was going to dress up for my talk but in the rush, because it's two weeks before the SOSP deadline, I have barely had time to shower. And so you're getting <laughs> me in my pajamas, basically. <laughs> so for all of everyone else who is feeling like they're just at home in their pajamas, I am literally at home in my pajamas. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna bring up my slides. I also would encourage everyone to definitely ask questions on the chat. Maybe somebody could, sort of like, I think you can wave your hands. Uh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> I like seeing the comments. That makes it seem more like I'm having an interactive discussion with a group of people than just talking to myself <laughs> in front of a computer. Um, so yeah, you know, share reactions. Feel free to raise your hand definitely if you have questions. Um, I'm gonna keep the technical stuff kind of short so I can talk about um, Women's Research Day and, and stuff like that. Um, but I, I do have some uh, research as well. All right, so yeah, as Jane mentioned, I'm a principal researcher at MSR and I graduated a couple of years ago from CSE. Um, and I am also the founder of Women's Research Day. Um, and so one of the asks was that I give a bit of history about Women's Research Day, um, which is great because I actually didn't anticipate that the event would actually last this long. Um, I, I don't know if it manages to make it to a decade. I guess we'll have to like do something special. Um, but hopefully next year or the year after we'll all actually be in person. Um, so to explain what happened with the genesis of Women's uh, Research Day, uh, we have to start by uh, talking about uh, Satya, who is now my CEO, <laughs> saying something incredibly, incredibly stupid at uh, Grace Hopper. And I thought this was actually really great because both that um, he basically was on a panel with Maria Clave, who, who um, you guys might know as the Harvey Mudd um, uh, president who's been a great proponent of um, women in CS. And basically um, Satya said, 
when asked a question about women and raises, he said, women should just let the system work for them. <laughs> Which of course was, you know, sort of <laughs> a downer. Uh, but I thought what was fantastic was that Satya actually, um, you know, Im almost immediately after um, said that he made a mistake it was a huge mistake and that he was just completely wrong. And there was no backpedaling or any sort of trying to, um, you know, say like, oh, I didn't understand or something. Um, and I really do feel like um, since then, Microsoft has done a really great job um, on inclusivity. Um, but then what happened after Satya said something stupid was that um, Ed said, we should use this chance uh, to actually do something good. Um, so what Ed did was he pulled together a group of people and talked to them about uh, what we could do to actually improve uh, inclusivity and sort of um, engagement among women and, and other minorities in CS. Um, and during this discussion, basically what we came up with was this idea of having a mini Grace Hopper for the people at CSE. Um, and so I ended up proposing and just deciding to do this um, and hoping that it wasn't going to be very much uh, work. Um, it turned out really not to be. Um, and that's one of the lessons that I really learned from Women's Research Day, which is that you can do something incredibly, incredibly small and it can actually have a huge impact. Um, and so basically in 2005, we held our first Women's Research Day. Um, we had a really great group of um, of women and you know it was i would say like i don't know five to ten meetings um between the organizing committee um and then of course the admins did a fantastic job actually running the event and so i think from this thing that was very small um which was well first of all satya saying something stupid <laughs> uh, it's turned into something that's um that you know was something for good um and so then you know, from 2005, we um, just got bigger and bigger. In 2017, I think we had pretty much filled Gates Commons. Um, and it was just really, really great to give a talk in general, uh, you know, where you're standing in front of an audience of primarily women. Um, and Ed would come sometimes and sort of give an introduction every year and talk about how, um, you know, the first time that he went to Grace Hopper, Grace Hopper was much smaller. It was probably a couple thousand people instead of the monster that it is now. But he said that as a white man, it was the first time he had ever, ever been in a room where he didn't feel like everybody else looked like him. And that was just the like a really nice note to try to continue that experience. Um, so in 2020, of course, we had our first uh, Zoom <laughs> uh, Women's Research Day uh, where everyone looked like squares, but women <laughs> in squares. Um, and now we're having our second one and hopefully, you know, sometime in the future, we'll have an in-person one. And, you know, I don't have any idea what this event might morph into. Um, the other thing that I'll note is that um, at least two other institutions have tried to start or have tried, have started um, their own women's research day events um, where they have technical talks for undergraduates. Um, and I have sort of given a blanket um, invitation to, or invited myself, the opposite of an invitation, I guess, whatever that would be, <laughs> um, to go and give a talk at any of these events. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's just, I want people to get the sense that, you know, it's a small thing that you could do that's very local um, and it doesn't have to be Grace Hopper sized, but it can still actually make a big difference to people. Um, so then I think after this, um, you know, people said that pretty much this was, you know, this event of Satya saying something really, really stupid, which started Women's Research Day, was actually one of the best things that happened, um, I think, to Satya, um, who is now very much about, um, you know, growth mindsets and having um, inclusive dialogues and making sure that everyone's voice is heard. Um, but then obviously this was also the best thing that happened for Women's Research Day because uh, Women's Research Day wouldn't have happened without it. And so I'm glad that, you know, out of something that was very um, depressing, 
basically, uh, you know, I think some good things have come out. Um, and then, of course, moving forward, I'm glad that we're moving on past uh, Women's Research Day. I, you know, I think two years ago, I was working with an engineer who was transgender, and she had never been in a group um, because of, of women and other, um, you know, people who identify sort of, yeah, just diversely because, um, you know, she had worked in the gaming industry and that was just very, very different. Um, and so I was, I was really happy that this event that was sort of just something that started in grad school actually turned out to be something that um, helped, you know, some people in my group at Microsoft as well. Um, so sort of starting Women's Research Day, um, you know, I spent a little bit of time thinking about what exactly we, we wanted the point of this event to be. Um, and I didn't, I mean, I didn't really think about it too long because I feel like, you know, um, it was a small event, right? So it didn't really matter that much. Um, but I think there were a couple of guiding principles towards, um, you know, this event over the years. So I think the first guiding principle, which was something that we discussed the very first time Women's Research Day was proposed, was that um, the event be focused on technical talks. Um, that we not spend, you know, the bulk of the event talking about women's issues, whatever those are, um, or, you know, just having panels where we complain about the times we've been harassed at conferences. Uh, you know, there's definitely a time and place for those. Uh, and I think they're still really, really important. Um, but this particular day, we wanted it to be more technical. And we wanted it to be technical in a very different way, which was just that it was all research that was being done by women and was being presented to women. And that was really the you know, primary focus rather than being about being a minority um, in this field. Um, then I think the, you know, the, the next step after I had sort of thought about this event a little bit more um, was I guess two things. Uh, one was that I realized that um, I felt like there was a lack of um, undergraduate research interest and interaction, especially between women. Um, so sort of back then, I think we didn't have mentoring a mentoring program yet through the ACM and um, yeah. And so it felt like, you know, there are a lot of fantastic undergraduate women. And if we wanted to increase the number of PhD women, we needed to make sure that we got undergraduate women interested. Um, so that was sort of step number one. Um, and then step number two, the th other thing that I realized was that um, at some point I had gone to Microsoft Research actually um, at, for a women's event um, where we had done breakout sessions based on technical area, which was really interesting for me because I realized that it was the first time that I had met a woman who was in my area and you know, did research that was very close to mine that was not basically my grandmother's age. <laughs> um, and this was actually really important for me because it was also one of the first times I had interacted with women who were not faculty members. And so having this idea that there were other research paths that I could take that didn't just mean you know, either going to a university and teaching or going to Google. Um, I think was really important. And so I think this idea of mentoring, you know, up and down towards the next step in your career and the previous step in your career is really, really important. That I feel like even now, one of the things that I struggle with is that I don't have a lot of time or opportunities to talk to many other recently graduated PhD students who are women. Um, and so basically, you know, sort of this keeping the chain going, the chain of mentoring going and fixing the leaky pipeline was essentially the other half. Um, and making sure that women got in touch with other women that were in areas that interested them. Um, and so that was pretty much, um, you know, the, the two things that we thought about when, when uh, we started Women's Research Day. And I think, you know, it's a great thing if it can grow. And, you know, the women's part of it, I think, is not even that important. We could call it anything else, you know, like diversity research day. Or, and so I'm really, really happy that we're expanding the event. Um, because to me, it's really the research part of it that's important. Uh, not so much 
the other parts that I wanted this day to be very focused on research. Um, okay, so with respect to role models, um, usually one of the asks that we had for um, the women giving talks was that they talk a little bit about how they got into computer science and the partic particular area of work that they're now currently in. And so I thought I would talk about that before I talk about my work. Um, so basically a little bit of a timeline for me. Um, in roughly 2013, I learned how to code. And this was actually really interesting because shortly after that, I went to MIT um, where I went to a computer science camp for women. Uh, and it was really, really fun because it was basically the first time I had ever been around, I think it was 40 of us, 40 other women who were all really into computers <laughs> or even just any sort of like coding or anything that was even math related, honestly. Um, and so I felt like that experience actually was just a really, really good um, sort of starting point. I guess I should also point out that my mom is a computer scientist. And so, you know, in terms of having role models, that one was sort of an easy one for me. And so for other people who don't get, aren't lucky enough to have that and then to go to a camp, um, you know, hopefully we can provide some more role models and mentoring here. Um, so then in 2004, I started MIT, where I was immediately assigned a, a, an advisor um, who uh, was, you know, a member of the faculty that was supposed to guide me through my undergraduate career. And I got, um, I don't know if anyone recognizes who this is, but this is Barbara Liskov. She, I think, is the first woman to get a PhD in computer science, and she's also a Turing Award winner. And basically I looked at Barbara and I thought, yeah, we really don't have anything in common. <laughs> you know, she does amazing research and, you know, is a leader in the field. I am getting regularly B's and C's in my computer science classes. Um, so that was, you know, it was, it was really a struggle um, for me at the time. Fortunately, um, I still had some undergraduate women that I was around at, who were interested in research. And so in 2009, I decided to apply to grad school. Um, I also graduated from MIT. I got both a master's and MEng um, and decided that, you know, I would at least think about a PhD. Um, due to various life factors, I actually didn't show up for my PhD until 2012. Uh, which is something that you actually can do. I was accepted into the Allen School and I deferred for three years <laughs> and actually had to reapply. <laughs> um, but I thought the gap was actually really great for me because um, during that time, I spent a lot of time um, learning how to code and I feel like building up a bunch of skills that I felt like I was weak on as a systems hacker. Um, this is a picture of me and my lab mate, Adriana, uh, at Hank's birthday party, I think, where we all had to wear mustaches and pretend we were French. <laughs> um, so then in 2017, I graduated and my mom was there to celebrate with me, as well as my sister, who this coming year will be starting as a PhD student at UW, um, but not in computer science. Uh, she actually does clinical psychology. So it's going to be very exciting for us to wear our matching robes. Um, and then now I have been spending most of my time at Microsoft Research um, hacking on computer systems and working with a lot of new um, programmable hardware. Um, although I would really say that most of the time I spend being a cat bed um, where my cats try to keep me from working and mostly I just comply. Um, I did promise uh, several people that there would be a lot of cat photos in this talk, so I do apologize if there aren't enough of them. Um, so things I'm interested in, I really like to do systems research. Um, to me, systems research is actually, uh, I think of it as HCI, but uh, without the humans. Uh, I don't really like humans, so instead I think about how computers talk to other computers and computer systems talk to other layers of the computer system. Um, but really what I like to think about are, um, you know, new hardware technologies that we have in the data center and how programmers should think about those hardware technologies and abstract them and use them. Um, I also spend a lot of time um, on Twitter, mostly posting photos of my cats, of which there are three. Um, and then in my 
other spare time I really like to eat <laughs> is basically I like to travel to eat. I like to cook to eat. I like to <laughs> go around Seattle on walking tours and eat. Um, and so those are all the things about me. I will, um, I guess in the interest of time, uh, just give a little bit of a brief introduction to my research. Um, so since I arrived at MSR, I've been working on this project called Demi Kernel. Um, and basically the idea is rethinking operating system abstractions for new data center hardware. Um, so this work uh, is really driven by some trends in, in data center architecture. Uh, happened in the last couple of years, which is really amazing, is that network speeds and other IO devices have just been getting really, really much faster than CPU speeds. Um, so a lot of people talk about Moore's law and how it's ending. I think what people don't also talk about is how um, the other side of it, it hasn't stopped. Um, and so network devices are really going to overtake CPUs soon and CPUs are going to become our bottleneck which for an operating systems person is sort of just this very bizarre thing to think about because operating systems mostly treat IO as something that happens at a very, very slow rate. Um, so given these trends, uh, essentially what we've ended up doing is we've started getting increasingly more complicated um, hardware to deal with this. So we've observed that operating systems kernels now actually, we're spending most of our time just running <laughs> operating systems, which is not really uh, an ideal uh, sort of state of the world. Um, and also that basically the things traditionally that your operating system does for you uh, are just too expensive to be able to afford. Um, if you have a data center application, which is mostly going to memory, so um, Redis is sort of a canonical example or memcached. Um, you know, Facebook and Twitter have terabytes of data in these systems um, and they keep them all in memory and they're able to access them with essentially two to three microsecond latencies, um, which is really crazy um, because that roughly equates to um, thousands of cycles where it's really pretty hard to do any sort of computing in a couple thousand cycles. So the hardware solution that we've come up for, with for this is something called kernel bypass, where essentially we um, move some of the functionality of our OS kernel into an IO device, and then just completely skip the OS kernel on the data path. So this lets applications like Redis just go straight to IO, right? So if they're spending two or three microseconds doing a get or a put, they can actually just shove that data back onto the wire um, very, very quickly. So this is kind of you know, good and bad. Um, it's super available. Um, the hardware has been there forever. Um, you can pretty much get it anywhere now. Um, and it's just really, really good. Like the hardware is good, um, it works. You get much faster performance and um, you know, basically, are able to improve your performance, your application performance for free for by about 80%. Um, so this is really great. Um, but of course, there are downsides. Um, I also apologize, it's been a little bit difficult me, for me to keep track of all people because every time I move the screen with the people, <laughs> I can't move my slides forward. <laughs> um, so uh, these App, these devices, unfortunately, are really hard to use, and they can only do certain things. So um, their use has been pretty limited because, you know, essentially you have no operating system anymore. You get a, a bare metal nick, and you know somebody just says like, "Okay, well, go at it." <laughs> um, and you know, if you're an application programmer, that is is pretty not ideal. Um, so I think I'm going to skip this slide because, um, yeah, I think. It's probably really not that necessary. Um, but to give you an idea of the things that um, we've come up with, so essentially the features that we've moved into the into the IO devices, they are things um, like multiplexing your device, so sharing your device among applications, um, and address translation, um, so taking virtual addresses to physical addresses that the device understands. Um, but it's not things like giving you a file system. 
and a networking stack, which in general are things that applications like to work with. Um, and so basically, um, applications now have to figure out how to do all of that stuff themselves because they just don't have it anymore. And so my research for the last couple of years has pretty much centered around how do we give these um, services that your operating system normally performs for your application back, uh, but to do it in a way that actually doesn't put all of the overhead back. Um, and this has required both designing new APIs for applications to use that are more efficient, um, as well as designing user level operating system services so that they can run in a library that's shared with your application, but um, and not have to go through the kernel, but still offer the sort of networking stack and file system that uh, we all know and love. Um, so I think, um, I, so I don't know how much time I should be able to run over and if people want to ask questions so that this is more interactive, um, but I'll definitely skip my slides a couple forward. So the idea behind Demi kernel is um, that for different devices that have different needs, we're gonna provide operating system services in different ways, um, but we're gonna give them all the same unifying API so that applications from their point of view still think that they're running on essentially very similar devices to the ones they were running on before, um, but they're much, much faster. And this also allows us to design new devices in the future where we get to control the device and we get to control the um, user level operating system. And so that means that we can, you know, ask the device to do specific things that um, we then can leverage for something else because we have an understanding of the application, for example. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit too about future work, but also have a chance to show more cute fat cat photos. Um, so the stuff that I talked about is, you know, it's not done, but we've been working on it for four years. So, um, you know, it's it's getting to a point where um, we've we've branched, started branching out and looking into different problems uh, from there. Um, and so, I wanted to talk a little bit about what else I'm excited about in the data center space for operating systems and new devices that are going to be really hard for application programmers to use, and they're going to sort of have to figure out on their own unless we do something to help them. Um, so the first one is non-volatile memory. Uh, so this is essentially memory that is one or two times slower than normal memory today, but it's completely persistent. Um, and it's also byte addressable, which means that you can just, you know, read and write to it. You don't have to like write a whole block at a time or, you know, it's just like regular memory. And so um, the interesting things there are, you know, how do you get an app? How do you take an application that normally would be used to running in memory, something like Redis, and actually make it persistent in a way that doesn't completely confuse the application itself? Um, so one of the things that we we did here, and I think there are a lot more things to do, is that we realized that when you look at distributed systems, and Redis would be one of them, systems that talk a lot over the network, um, they're actually really well modeled as state machines. Um, because they take in network packets, they perform operations, and then they spit results back out. Um, and so understanding this, we were actually able to take a bunch of applications and um, encapsulate them inside state machines and essentially without modifying their code, make them just think that they were running. Um, and when the machine crashed, nothing happened and the application just came back and it was just back the way that it was before the machine crashed at all. Um, and so, you know, the challenges are figuring out how to do this in a way that doesn't require you to completely rewrite your applications. And that's pretty much what's been happening with NVRAM non-volatile memory today. Um, so there's another really cool project in our group that I wanted to talk about for a minute too, um, because Daniel Berger, who's the lead researcher on it, um, I think is teaching one of the classes at CSC this uh, this quarter. Um, and that's disaggregated compute. So I, they're working on a project to basically take data center computers and put them in giant pools of liquid. Um, not like water, but like cooling liquid. So like giant swimming pool bathtubs of data center computers. Um, and if you do this, you can actually pack your, your computer is a lot closer because one of the things that actually um, 
keeps us from making data centers more dense is that the computers would melt uh, if we put pack them any closer together. Um, the other thing that you can do is sort of have one giant pool tub of CPUs and another giant pool tub that is all memory. And then there's a question of, well, okay, if you're writing an application, I, I don't know how you're supposed to use your two giant pool tubs of memory and, and, and CPUs. Um, and so I think this is a really interesting new area for us to think about data center abstractions for um, and how we're going to sort of wrap up and present those um, new technologies to programmers. Um, and then the last one that's been around for a, a while, but we haven't used very aggressively is that more and more um, IO devices and other kinds of devices in the data center are programmable themselves. So you can actually program your NIC. Um, I'm working with some CSE students um, on programming NICs with TCP stacks and um, to, to do other things. And they're really, really hard to work with. <laughs> you basically need a PhD in both electrical engineering, computer science probably to actually work with one of these devices. And so that doesn't make them very um, accessible to most programmers. Um, but eventually you could imagine programmers really needing to use them as CPUs increasingly get expensive, but not much faster. Um, and so this is another area that I'm very excited about in terms of how do we wrap up and you know what APIs and programming tools should we be giving to programmers so that they can work with these devices that um, you know have weird architectures or limited um, functionality? Um, yeah, so that's it. Um, if you're interested in Demi Kernel, we're um, you know online, uh, but also just feel free to email me or ask about um, yeah about my work. Thanks. Thank you so much, Irene. Uh, I really appreciate your talk today and thank you for sharing what you're working on and um, I encourage anyone that's interested in what Irene's doing to reach out like it is it is hard to write that cold email or that first email that first time and the worst she can say is not reply because she's too busy but she probably will get back to you so thank you so much if you could give like yes I will definitely get back to you <laughs> a virtual round of applause and, and thank you Irene for your time today we really appreciate it and it's also lovely to see uh the history of women's research today and as we move forward to diverse uh genders in CS day I'm excited I'm excited to continue that path